Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us and helping us to think through this difficult topic. Um, humanitarianism always prided itself on being impartial, objective, neutral, um, and yet it has also been able to accommodate uh, things that required a sensitive approach to difference, like gender-sensitive humanitarianism. So the question we have today is, can we have humanitarianism that can still pride itself on being impartial and neutral um, and also accommodate the realities of religious difference in relation to those that are uh, that have freedom of uh, have have a faith or no faith and what is the situation now and what would we hope to see it become um, so very very delighted to have with me uh, dr jennifer who um, um, is part of the Joint Learning Initiative, an amazing initiative that looks at the role of faith in, um, in, in agency and in change processes around the world. And very delighted to have uh, Mariam with us, who represents El Ho'i Foundation and is the manager for the creed work that El Ho'i uh, is leading. And very delighted to have Jeremy with us from uh, the Religious Freedom Institute. And here he's in his capacity um, as a researcher with Creed, um, and they will all be presenting the findings of empirical work that they have just completed, just, just in the last months that they have been working on intensely, very intensely, um, um, uh, <laughs> uh, two reports that are from Iraq and from uh, Pakistan slash Afghanistan, but I'll, I'll leave the space uh, for them to tell us more. Um, so first is, what is the lay of the land? What is the situation in relation to how humanitarianism is engaging with issues of freedom of religion or belief? So Jennifer, what have you discovered in terms of how, what is the humanitarian lens onto this issue? Um, yeah, thank you so much, Maris. Um, really excited to be here. Hello, everyone. Um, I thought before I tell you about our findings, I'll just say a couple of words about the research itself so that you know um, where, where we're coming from. Um, so we were, um, um, we, we, we did research um, for CREED. Um, it was a joint CREED um, GLI project. Um, I um, was lucky enough to work with Mariam and our colleague Jeffa, who is also here in the audience, and a group of Pakistani, um, well, Pakistan-based researchers um, who unfortunately can't be here today with us. Um, basically for two reasons. First of all, it wouldn't be safe for them. We can't even identify them um, as part of the research. Um, they are part of the Shia Hazara community themselves. Um, secondly, they probably wouldn't even get a visa to come to the UK. <laughs> but that's just as a side note. Um, and um, yeah, in our research that focused on the situation of Afghan refugees in um, Pakistan with a specific focus on Shia Hazara refugees, we looked at to what extent are humanitarian responders aware and responsive to religious inequalities. Um, we conducted more than 30 interviews. Um, and um, what we found was really, and I'll, um, I'll focus on um, the um, response of the formal international and national humanitarian responders. After that, Mariam will speak about informal and local respon uh, responses. Because we obviously have the two, right? We, we often when we say humanitarian response, we focus on the formal responses, but local communities, they're often at the front lines. Um, so we found that the international and national formal response showed much lower levels of awareness um, and responsiveness um, to religious inequalities. Um, for a lot of them, it was a taboo to speak about faith at all, let alone religious inequalities. Um, some of them didn't have access. Um, and some also acknowledged systemic constraints of the humanitarian, the formal humanitarian system. Um, some of the Muslim NGOs, we were looking at Pakistan, so there are obviously quite a few Islamic um, faith-based organizations. They were also under um, particular pressure because of allegations of links to terrorism, um, Islamophobia, and so on. Um, and I have a lot more to say, but um, I know we have limited time, and I want the others to be able to speak as well, so I leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Of course, it's always great to hear time for Q&A, so it's fine. 
So, Mariam, what did you discover when you interviewed and engaged with those that were on the front line as people were coming in from Afghanistan into Pakistan in terms of informal as Jennifer told them responses? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Jan uh, um, Jennifer and Maris. So uh, as Jennifer, my colleague, you know, uh, has already uh, talked about our research with Creed, uh, with the Shia Hazara refugees. So uh, just to, you know, give, uh, share the context. So Shia Hazara uh, community, they face persecution on the basis of their religious as well as ethnic identity uh, at both sides of the border in Pakistan and in Afghanistan. So when uh, in August after the Taliban took over Afghanistan, so the Shia Hazara minority, so many people, especially we have discovered you know, through our research that so many young women, especially they were uh, leaving Afghanistan and then they were, because Pakistan, there was this easy access, so they were coming to Pakistan from Afghanistan. So we have worked with uh, local support, uh, system, local organizations, very grassroots, civil society organizations through our research. And what we have discovered is uh, uh, to a very, I would say, horrifying as well. Uh, because in Pakistan, what was happening is pa there was no official position of Pakistan. They were not um, admitting. The official position was that there are no refugees in Pakistan. Nobody is coming you know, from Afghanistan and Pakistan because Taliban's all of a sudden has become, you know, so good human beings. Uh, and there is no persecution in happening in Afghanistan. So this was the uh, official position. Now, uh, and then what was happening on the ground, we, we discovered that the refugees, especially Shia Hazaras, they were being deported uh, to Afghanistan. Uh, so in that context, when we were working with the, with the local uh, civil society, grassroots organizations and activists who were supporting and facilitating the refugees, uh, we found out that uh, there was a crackdown, not just against the refugees, but also against those faith-based, secular, uh, both faith-based faith and uh, secular organizations, grassroots community uh, organizations and activists. And there was, there was harassment and indeed intimidation against them. So this is, you know, that was the context. But we also dis discovered that, you know, because Shia Hazaras, uh, uh, they were coming to those areas and neighborhoods that were specific to Shia Hazaras. So the community, they were more aware of their needs as a community because the community in Pakistan and in Afghanistan, they are facing almost the same persecution. So at some level, yes, there was this support system, but at the same time, because the local support system, they were also facing an intimidation and harassment and, uh, uh, you know, uh, and threats from the state security operators. So it was not easy for them. And with the limited resources, it was not easy for them to facilitate and hosting the refugees. So I would stop here, but you know, uh, I'll also uh, then, you know, can answer, happy to answer any Q&A. Thank you, thank you so much, Mayim. So we see a formal humanitarian response of blindness. Nothing's happening. Uh, we don't engage with this reality. But one thing we always forget is what you're talking about, Mariam, is that sometimes the response isn't just blindness, it is disabling those who have a positive agency to exercise on the ground. They're not asking for funds, they're not asking for support, they're just asking to be let to, to use their networks to be able to support people. So here it's not just blindness, it's actually antagonism, it's opposition to what can be done. Um, so, uh, I, I I, I, we, always, we always sometimes focus on those that are the direct targets of freedom of religion or belief violations, but we, we need to sort of sometimes broaden our circle to also look at those that want to redress these inequalities and whether we are enabling them or not, because that's part of the story that we also need to read. So we moved from this situation to Iraq, where, Jeremy, you looked at um, the... Western development humanitarian architecture in, in, in Iraq, and you looked at both the programmatic uh, claims making to inclusivity, to diversity, to uh, promoting leave no one behind, to uh, inclusive development and humanita inclusive humanitarian responses. 
and you took a very interesting multi-tiered methodological approach to understanding what does this mean on the ground. Tell us about your methodology and tell us about, in a nutshell, what were the main findings in relation to how aware and responsive humanitarianism was to the wonderful diversity that, that, that represents the Iraqi people on the ground. Yeah, well, thank you so much and a privilege to, to be working uh, with Creed, with, with Maurice and, and others on this. Um, yeah, so looking at Iraq and, and as uh, Maurice mentioned, kind of the 2014 to, to 2019 as, as a case study and particularly the, the UK assistance, which the way they approached uh, that crisis was, was to work particularly through the multilateral system, through the humanitarian pool fund, through um, UN entities, OCHA, um, and others. And so looking at, at that and kind of how assistance flowed out, what, what was funded and, and what was delivered on through that. And so an evaluation of program documents, um, a number of, of key informant interviews with both current and past officials uh, within uh, UK assistance structure, UN entities, uh, and then international and local NGOs. Um, and, uh, and so evaluating and kind of really looking at this assistance, what did they set out to do, what did they do, and, and what were the outcomes from that? Um, one of the things to begin with that, that has come through already so much is the, the religious diversity dynamics was kind of the, the shorthand um, phrase that I, I used to kind of capture all of the ways in which religious and community identity in impacts individual, social, community interactions, both within communities, between communities, with the state, with these assistance structures. All of that shapes everything from access to formal, informal forms of assistance, displacement, patterns of displacement, returns. All of that matters and is shaped profoundly by these religious diversity dynamics. And, and so, and Maurice mentioned the kind of humanitarian principles from the beginning, and I think Whatever those mean, they can't mean a blindness to the ways in which those forms of identity shape people's lives and interaction with their community. And yet, so often that, that seems to be what happens within, within the formal assistance structures. One way to, to describe that is looking at, at the UK assistance program documents that covered five years of, of programming, more than two, or nearly 250 million pounds through both direct assistance through the UN, um, in those documents, more than 75 times, they talk about vulnerability, and, and their aim was to assist the most vulnerable. They give more than, more than two dozen examples of what does that vulnerability look like? What are factors, whether it's women and girls, female-headed household, households, disability, and the like? Among all of those, only one time uh, out of more than 75 was religion mentioned at all, and it was the potential risks of the Sunni majority if they were displaced into areas where that are Shia or Kurdish ma majority areas. So in, in the context of, of a genocide committed explicitly against religious minority communities, the only mention of that dynamic within all of these do documents was, was one time. And it, it just shows the massive blind spot that, that matters and and those do matter, and this was something that came through in the interviews. Um, I remember in particular um, an interview with a former country director uh, for an international NGO um, who described um, kind of that and the, um, the humanitarian response plan, kind of these collective documents that frame the crises, the way in which funds are set out. She kind of described it as, this is the, the dance card, kind of how it's described there, shapes how I find my partners for funding, how we defined our programs, what are the objectives we aim to hit? And so that matters for program design, for program implementation, for funding. And when this is completely absent at that level, it carries out and has real world impacts to what's funded and implemented on the ground. And so that was kind of what came through first at the policy level and, um, and just showed ways in which it's just this massive gap that has real world on the ground implementations in what's funded, what's assisted, and, and what the outcomes are for that. So that's kind of what came out of, of the, this research. Um, some ideas maybe on, on where it might go, but we'll stop there for now and, and give some of those maybe in the, the second round. Thank you very much, Jamie. Um, we could take all day in terms of what needs to be redressed in the humanitarian architecture 
because there is the potential to redress it if there is an acknowledgement that there is a disconnect. Um, but um, because of limitations on time, we're asking our uh, panelists to, of all the potential uh, pathways for change, uh, what would you see as most important that can potentially, if taken seriously, make a difference on the ground in order for us to be able to reach those that need to be reached? Um, I'll start again with Dr. Jennifer. Thank you, Maris. Um, and I was thinking about exactly this question on the, on the train here to London. Um, I thought, what, what, what sort of recommendations do we have? Um, now, we've mentioned the report, um, uh, over 60 pages, um, where everything is beautifully laid out for you with lots of recommendations. It's going to come out very soon. So if you, next week. Um, so if you want all the details, um, that's where I would go. And it will be available on the, um, on the Creed website, JLI as well. Um, yes. And, um, but I thought, can we, can we dance this down a little bit and maybe focus on three, three key points? Um, and I have three key points for you today. Um, the first um, thing that I, um, or we based on the research, um, would recommend to people is um, religion and um, by, by, by extension inequalities based on religion they are often a taboo in humanitarian circles. This is something that was very, very clear from our research. Um, people are scared to even speak about it for a variety of reasons, and we can go into a lot of details there. I could tell you um, about the pressure that a lot of our interviewees, um, even from international organizations based in Pakistan, wear. We, we were actually advised to focus on another topic. <laughs> Dr. Jennifer, why not education? We have massive issues with education in this country. Yes, we know, but <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So this this would be a this would be a first step, and um, this is we know that this is a problem across the board, um, and all of us are most of us are complicit to to, to some extent. So um, we we would really need some critical self reflection about the assumptions that we are making about the role of religion in international development, in humanitarian assistance, in refugee um, report, the assumptions that we're making about sectoralism, the assumptions that we're making about um, the role that these play, right? I mean, there's still so many people who just assume that secular approaches are neutral approaches. And I'm sorry, but it is a tiny bit more um, um, complicated than that, right? So let's speak about these questions. They might be uncomfortable for a lot of us, um, but we can't get around it. It's affecting people's lives, right? Um, so are we really true humanitarians if we just pretend that some of these realities didn't exist? That's point number one. Point number two, we need to speak about the contributions of local actors and local communities, people who are on the ground, people who can't afford to just fly out again when there is the next emergency around the corner. Right? And I mean, we all have these horrible, horrible, horrible pictures in mind from summer last, we, uh, last year. Um, so what are we doing for these people? What are we doing for the people who often provide so much support to people who need it the most? Um, are we there for them? Do we support them? If they find themselves in a situation where they want to provide support and they do provide support, but it's rendered illegal by the system, and in the case of um, our research, it was, um, it was the legal system of the state in Pakistan, but in other contexts, it could be other things. What do we do for them? Are we there for them? Do we support them? Not just by words, but by actions. Um, and this includes all local actors, mm. not just the ones that look and sound like what we like to see and hear. So in a lot of contexts, this means not just secular groups who speak international NGO language, who speak international policy, are familiar with international policy terms, mm -hmm. but everyone, including faith-based organizations, whenever that is relevant. Third point um, is to think carefully about what are the barriers for national and international organizations as well, because they fa face barriers as well. It became very clear to us. We spoke with representatives of international humanitarian organizations and just because of their location, just because of the fact that they were 
people from the country, in the country, who again didn't have an exit strategy, not an easy one at least, um, they were under pressure to conform and they were under pressure, they could only go as far as, um, as the legal context allowed them. So are we aware of these barriers? Are we aware of, we spoke with quite a few, I mentioned it already, Muslim NGOs, right? Because of the context, Pakistan. They work there, they have um, better access in some ways. Um, are we aware of the additional pressures that they face? They, they kept on explaining to me that um, how Islamic case is in line with humanitarian principles and I just sat there and I felt a bit sorry that they felt the need to explain this so much. But this is the world that we have created, right? Um, where some of us literally feel they need to explain and justify themselves for sorry, this is my faith. So are we, are we taking this into account? Or do we just continue to attend our fancy shiny policy events, speak our fancy shiny policy language um, without actually thinking of the people who do the work and who get, get their hands dirty and who are at risk, right? Um, yes, so that's the three points I would make. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Marian, complementing those points, what things would you would feel would make a real difference on the ground if taken seriously, consistently seriously? Thank you, Jennifer, for taking all my, you know, <laughs> <laughs> talking points. <laughs> so, but uh, in addition to what, you know, Jennifer has already uh, said, I would add, so a understanding of um, local sensitivities and context. And we have seen from our research that, you know, it's such an important but missing. You know, it's despite, you know, the fact that it's so important. And I would uh, share an example, which is, you know, from the ground. So Shia Hazaras, you know, I have already talked about them. So she, when they travel uh, from Afghanistan to Pakistan, they have to, everyone who is traveling, you know, these refugees, because uh, most of them, they are traveling without documents, without any legal, you know, uh, documents. So they have to pay bribe to the smugglers or sometimes to the security, uh, you know, uh, border security. Um, but when Shia Hazaras, you know, when they travel, they have to pay extra bribe to the same, you know, border security people and the same uh, smugglers, human traffickers. So this is one thing that, you know, we have noticed. So uh, also, you know, yeah, uh, second thing, uh, another example. So in some humanitarian, or, uh, we have seen that, you know, some humanitarian organizations, they set up the camps, uh, eight camps in some neighborhoods, which has been hostile towards Shia Hazara community. And because Shia Hazara community in Koita, they are already living in ghettos, and uh, there are so many, amid so many check posts, and without legal documents, one can perhaps not even imagine that they cannot, it's not easy for them to pass all these check posts, and then reach to an area, a neighborhood, which uh, has a history of hostility uh, against, you know, against them. So I think the humanitarian assist, uh, assistant, uh, assistance, humanitarian organizations, they need to be mindful of these local sensitivities. So this is you know, my first point. Second point, I would emphasize on inclusion of local grassroots community activists from the same community and community organizations and civil society organizations, but at a very grassroots level. Because these are the people, they are also suffering the same level of persecution. So they understand the context, sensitivities, and they understand the level of persecution against their own community. So their inclusion is very critical, very cr crucial. And I also would emphasize that, you know, when we talk about inclusion, inclusion of women and young people as well, from the refugee backgrounds perhaps, because this is also very important. In, uh, women and young people, they have different needs uh, than, you know. So I think when uh, humanitarian organizations, they also need to be mindful of including young people and women and ensure. Plus we have also noticed, and it's very uncomfortable, uh, it's an uncomfortable truth that within these organizations, sometimes there are discriminatory practices. Uh, so, so this is also uh, 
you know, something we need to be uh, mindful. Thank you. Jenny, I'm afraid we're, we're running out of time, so if you can... I will be s incredibly brief. They've great. already, gratefully, yes. they've taken all of my points. Um, <laughs> so, um, but we'll be very brief. One recommendation is specifically engage. Is that, is that possible? One of the findings, as I was looking at one of the annual reports, it said something that was really remarkable and striking to me. It's like all 38 projects that were funded from this humanitarian pooled fund employed a gender sensitive lens in their work. Great, that's fantastic. Could you say the same to a religious sensitive lens? Based on what we know now, you couldn't even begin to approach saying that, whether it matters or not. And so that's the potential of, of where we need to go in, in our conflict assessment or in our vulnerability assessments of to adopt that lens to the programs, where it matters, how it matters, um, use our tools to ask and answer those questions as well. And that will include reaching things like access, um, the dynamics around return and those sorts of things that have all been said. And then the last point that, that all three of us mentioned around kind of the role of lo local faith actors and representatives of these communities. One point around that is recognizing that's, that's one tactic to address inequality. It doesn't necessarily go all the way there. To include the Yazidi community at the table is really important. It doesn't necessarily get to addressing the inequalities toward that community. So it's vital, it's important, but it's only one step on the way towards redressing those inequalities. Um, lots more, also a report that's coming out, not next week, but uh, shortly as well, so lots more there, but thank you. Thank you very much to our panelists and thank you for coming and just two things very quickly. Uh, they are here if you want to uh, ask them further questions. Um, and uh, there is a uh, the great thing about this, despite the very uncomfortable truth is that uh, as Jeremy was saying, it's not that we need more toolkits and new tools and new blah, 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 and blah, 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 and we create an industry around new ways. What uh, a brilliant report uh, that Jennifer and uh, Olivia, Dr. Jennifer and Dr. Olivia produced was you can use the existing tools if you are serious, if there is a political and social will there that the tools in the humanitarian architecture would allow you to take a four sensitive lens or a religious sensitive lens if we are serious about applying them. And this brilliant report that is already out, speak to Emily about it, it is out there, it is open access, uh, tells us what are the tools that are available to us if we press uh, those that are committed to inclusive humanitarianism that they can use. And thank you very much for coming. Thank you to our panelists. And please feel free to come and have a chat with them um, about their work. Thank you. Thank you.